So welcome everybody to the very last uh, section of this school, this beautiful school in this very nice place. And uh, my name is Daniel, I'm from Rio, and I'm gonna be the chair of this session. So we're gonna have the third lecture from Professor Matthew LaHaye. Please. Thank you. And I think uh, Marcelo forgot one group of uh, people to thank, and that's the, the organizers here. So we could all thank them. It's been, it's been a wonderful week. Okay, so um, let me just recap the last two uh, lectures. In the first lecture, I, told, I tried to give you a, a sense of the variety of different applications and fundamental pursuits that uh, mechanical um, qu quantum systems were being developed for. And then yesterday, um, in that lecture, I started talking about some of the experimental challenges we face in developing these systems. And also I talked about you know, the state of the art and developing uh, techniques and tools uh, for quantum measurement of these mechanical devices. And so what I want to do today is talk about um, the state of the art of another tool that the field is developing now, and that's uh, based on superconducting qubits coupled with nano and micromechanical systems. So, um, you know, in the back in the way back in the first lecture, I talked about how the you know the very first proposal uh, putting forth the idea of, of integrating these two systems uh, was put forth by Keith Schwab and his co colleagues Andrew Armour and Miles Blanco back in, in 2002. And in a few slides, I'll get into the details of how this system works. But in a nutshell, what they proposed was that you know you could take this solid state superconducting charge qubit uh, and integrate it on chip, on a wafer, with uh, some flexural nanomechanical device or micromechanical device. And then by applying a simple voltage between the two systems, you could establish an interaction that then enabled you to use the qubit as a tool uh, to manipulate and measure the, the mechanical device. So for instance, in this proposal here, they talked about ways to prepare superposition states of the mechanical device. In this other one up here, they talk about using the qubit as a means for probing the, the energy spectrum of the mechanics. Okay, and so, um, you know, around the time that they put these proposals forward, there was a series of beautiful experiments that had been ongoing for a decade uh, in the field of, of cavity QED and, and ion trap physics that were really, uh, in many ways, analogous to this pr new proposal that was being put out. And I just, you know, for those of you who haven't seen these, these papers here, these are reviews from back in the early 2000s on the fields of cavity QED and, and ion trap uh, systems. And if you haven't seen them, it's definitely uh, worth checking out. But, you know, in cavity QED, for instance, people were beginning to use atoms as uh, a means to manipulate and measure the quantum properties of microwave and optical cavities. Uh, you know, the internal degrees of freedom of ions were being used to explore the quantum properties of motion of the ions in various traps. And so these systems were really being developed as test beds for studying quantum mechanics. And I think there was a lot of hope with these, this proposal here that this qubit coupled mechanical system would also become uh, a test bed for studying quantum mechanics. So um, a couple years after this, in, in 2004, uh, Andrew Cleland and his colleague uh, Michael Geller put forth another uh, proposal um, utilizing nano resonators and, and superconducting uh, two level systems. And their idea involved a, a nano mechanical disk resonator. It's a piezoelectric disk, which I'll, I'll talk more about later. Uh, but they propose using this to mediate interactions between uh, superconducting phase qubits. And I'll, also, I'll say more later on also about what uh, phase qubits are. And, you know, in this work, they outline uh, ways to transfer state information from qubits into the mechanical resonator and also how to store information in that resonator. So what they were proposing was really um, a potentially highly scalable and versatile uh, quantum circuit element. So I should say that uh, you know these proposals. This one here was 2004. The one by Schwab was 2002. And this was you know before this sort of rapid development we've seen in the last 10 years in superconducting qubit technology and circuit QED. And so nowadays, uh, people in the field of superconducting quantum computing don't even use uh, Cooper pair boxes or phase qubits anymore. They've developed new qubits uh, with names like the transmon and fluxonium that have 
been demonstrated to you know be much higher quality than than those you know sort of first generation qubits. For example, the trans transmon has been demonstrated to have coherence times uh, approaching 100 microseconds. Fluxonium has been demonstrated to have relaxation times in the excess of a millisecond. Um, and so these these devices now have been integrated with microwave cavities, one-dimensional microwave cavities, 3D microwave cavities for mani manipulating and measuring uh, quantum properties of of those cavities. They're also being uh, developed for use in, in quantum information processing. Uh, the transmon is at the heart of some of the ideas for scalable quantum processors that, for instance, IBM is, is uh, pursuing. And I've just put a reference down here uh, from Michelle Deveray and, and Rob Sholkoff. It's a review from Science in 2013 where they, they look at sort of the circuit QED and these kind of uh, qubits and their applications for quantum information. So you can learn more about that field um, from there. From the perspective of, of mechanics, this is all, these developments are really wonderful for us. I mean, it's in our best interest to take this technology that's been developed and the know-how that's uh, what people have learned and try to adapt this to our mechanical systems to really try and develop uh, these qubit coupled mechanical devices as the test bed that they were initially envisioned to, to be. So that's my introduction. Um, let me give an outline for the, for the remainder of this talk. So what I'll do today is really just sort of discuss the development of qubit coupled mechanics. Uh, initially I'll talk about um, the Cooper pair box, the, the initial charge qubit and how uh, a little bit about how it works and how you can integrate it with the mechanical system, and I'll discuss some early experimental results. Uh, I'll then get into discussing work done with a phase qubit coupled to mechanical systems. And then in the final part of the talk, I'll, I'll discuss recent work in the last few years where we've uh, the different groups have begun to integrate these sort of new species or new developments in circuit QED uh, with mechanics. Okay, the point to take home is that these systems uh, they have the potential to serve as a test bed for studying uh, you know, the quantum properties of motion with micro and nanomechanical systems. Okay, so the, the Cooper pair box or CPB qubit, what is it? Um, essentially, it's a micron, micron sized superconducting box that couples to superconducting leads through a couple of low capacitance. Capacitance Josephson junctions, and so I've put on here uh, both a circuit diagram and an SEM image uh, of a device a friend of mine made uh, to illustrate, the, you know, the basic parts of the, of the the CPB. And so you can see in the, in the circuit diagram here, the box or the island is this part here. It's a superconducting electrode. It's isolated from a couple other leads through these uh, oxide junctions, which serve as as Josephson junctions. There's also usually an electrode nearby which you can apply a voltage to to polarize the island there. Okay, and you can, you know, mapping this onto this SEM image down at the bottom here, the island of the qubit is right here, the junctions are here and here, and these are the leads, superconducting leads, and actually there's two gates here for applying voltages to that, that island. I said uh, these junctions are low capacitance, so these, as you can tell here, this is a microscopic system, actually the line widths are 100 nanometers or something, the total capacitance of this little box here and here is usually on the order of a femtofarad, so a really small capacitance. And uh, why that's important will become apparent in a, a few slides. And you know the, the coupling capacitance to the electrodes is even smaller, tens of attofarads. For the realization of this qubit, there's really four energy scales that you need to be aware of. Uh, so the quasi-particle gap energy, so the energy between the Cooper pair ground state and the quasi-particle energy band. There's a Josephson energy and charging energy, and I'll explain those in a, a couple minutes. And then, of course, thermal energy. And so for proper operation of, of this qubit, you really need to have the following hierarchy of, of these energy scales. You want the gap energy to be greater than uh, the Josephson energy and, and charging energy, and you want those to be greater than any thermal energy. And so the reason for this hierarchy, uh, really quickly, is that this gap energy really sets, it, it's really related to dissipative processes. Right, anything occurring on this energy scale here will cause Cooper pairs to break up and it will cause the creation of quasi-particles and those are dissipative. And any kind of dissipation is anathema to a coherent operation of, of these devices. So we want our, you know, our dynamics, the energy scales of our dynamics, which are set by the charging energy and the Josephson energy, to be less than that. We also want to make sure actually that you know, these systems are well shielded so that we don't have radiation coming in at these frequencies, the, the, the gap frequency that can create quasi-particles. 
And of course, you want the dynamics to be greater than the, the characteristic thermal energy, so no thermal processes uh, can destroy any uh, dynamics of your system. What I want to do now, we'll forget about the gap energy and thermal processes and just talk about uh, the ch you know, what these, these two terms are that determine the dynamics. Okay. So I'll talk first about the, the Josephson energy. And I imagine that this is probably a review for most of you, but in case it's not, let me just go through it. Um, we can understand the Josephson energy by just looking first at one junction. So what we have for the junction here is uh, you know, two superconducting aluminum electrodes separated by this thin oxide barrier. Usually, it's that thickness of the barrier is on the order of 20 angstroms. And of course, because the aluminum is superconducting, we can describe the Cooper pairs in each one through these macroscopic wave functions. And as we all know, that these wave functions don't end abruptly at, at the barrier. They can leak through and overlap with each other. So that leads to tunneling of, of Cooper pairs across that junction there. Okay? And of course, the physics of this, the physics of that, that tunneling process are described by the, the Josephson effects, the DC Josephson effect and the AC. And so the DC effect tells us that a supercurrent is going to flow through this junction if there's a phase difference, a non-zero phase difference between the wave functions on the two sides. Okay, so if you have non-zero difference between the wave function here and here, a dissipationless current of uh, you know, coherently tunneling Cooper pairs can flow through. Okay. The AC Josephson effect tells us how the phase of difference between these two wave functions will change if we apply some kind of voltage bias across the junction there. Right? So if you apply a, a DC voltage here, the phase will start increasing linearly in time, and so then the current will start uh, to oscillate. So how can we ascribe an energy to what's going on here? Well, we can get an idea of how, how to do that by realizing the following thing. What this AC Josephson effect tells us is that if we apply a voltage, and let's say the phase difference is initially zero, if we apply a voltage, a phase difference will start to be created. But as that happens, we'll start to also have current running through the junction, right? So any source, if it's a battery, some kind of voltage source that we're using to apply this voltage, it's also going to have to source current, all right? And so what that means is, we're gonna, the, that source that you're using is going to have to do work to get this current moving here. Okay? And that, that energy that the source is providing is going into the, what's called the kinetic inductance of these Cooper pairs that are tunneling through. It's basically their inertia uh, of them moving dissip in a dissipationless manner through the, the junction. Okay? And we can calculate what this work is that needs to be done by your source just in the, the usual way. We would integrate you know, the power basically being supplied by the source, the I times V over time. And you can substitute into this the, the Josephson relations here and do the integration and you arrive at a really simple expression. You have just a constant term and then this term here and just rewriting. This first term is known as the Josephson energy. This is the work, the phase dependent work, or I should say the work done <laughs> Let me try it one more time. The work required to create this uh, this phase difference, all right? And um, yeah, so we just, I've just rewritten it there. But again, it, it's the amount of energy you have to supply to create this this phase difference. Okay, let me uh, make uh, an important side note. This is just for one junction. If you have two junctions, like we normally do with these these qubits, um, you have a slightly modified form for the Josephson energy. It picks up an extra factor here that depends upon the magnetic flux that you're applying, that is uh, threading this loop here. And I, I'm not going to derive this. You can look at Tinkham or Feynman's book to, for that uh, derivation if you haven't seen it before. But in a nutshell, this cos cosinusoidal dependence on flux just arises from the fact that uh, the wave function at any point around this loop needs to be single valued. It's basically a flux quantization. Um, Effect. Okay, so this is the Josephson energy. Okay, let's talk about um, the electrostatic energy of, of the Cooper pair box next. Okay, the other important term for determining the qubit's dynamics. So the electrostatic energy is just given by this expression right here, and what it represents basically is the amount of electrostatic energy it takes to take a charge and put it on this little box or island there. Okay, so you can see here that there's a prefactor in this energy, EC. It's known as the, the charging energy. And the charging energy is essentially the energy required to put a single electron on the, the box here. But importantly, you can see that 
as you might imagine, it's inversely proportional, proportional to the total capacitance of this island. And I told you earlier that the, that total capacitance for the system is usually really small. It's on the order of hundreds of attofarads or a femtofarad. So that gives you an idea that for even small transfers of charge, like one Cooper pair from the leads to the island, it could be prohibitively expensive or costly. It could cost uh, a sizable amount of energy. All right. So again, this is just gauging the electrostatic cost of moving a charge from the leads to the island. In this expression here, let me just explain the other terms. So N is the number of Cooper pairs that have tunneled onto the island. And NG is just the gate voltage that you're applying to a nearby electrode, and it's been normalized with respect to the uh, one Cooper pair. Okay. Uh, to get some intuition about how this works, we have a plot here showing the electrostatic energy for different values of charges that have tunneled onto the Cooper pair box island. So you have a series of parabolas here for each of these different number states, for numbers of charges that have tunneled on. And so you know, if you start off at NG equals zero here, so you're not applying any voltage, what this, the way to interpret this is that n equals zero state is the most likely state. It's energetically favorable for no charges to have tunneled onto the island. But as you increase ng, so you start going up this parabola here, it's still energetically favorable for the state to be n equals zero. But then you get to this point here where you intersect the parabola for the n equals one state. And so at this point, it now becomes energetically favorable for a Cooper pair to tunnel on. And then if you increase ng more, uh, it remains n equals one. You get to this point here, it now becomes energetically favorable for n equals two, the ton uh, a second electron to tunnel on, and so on as you increase the eight volt up. The important thing I want to point out is these intersections here, where the different charge energy bands intersect, are known as charge degeneracy points. So at these points, it's equally likely for zero Cooper pairs to tunnel on, or one to tunnel on, or and so on as you go up to these different degeneracies. Okay. And so, actually, these are important because this is actually where the Josephson energy comes into play, where the Josephson energy becomes important. And so what I want to do is just focus on this region here. Uh, we'll zoom in on the degeneracy between n equals 0 and n equals 1. And so what happens is, when you include the Josephson energy in the description, instead of having the bare charge states, n equals 0 and n equals 1 parabolas intersecting like you did before, you now have two new uh, energy bands, this ground state and excited state here, that are split, that are, the degeneracy is lifted by the, the Josephson energy. Okay, so all that the Josephson energy is doing is just mixing the charge states. It's mixing the 0 and 1 uh, charge states there. Okay, so now, to describe this system, the dynamics of the system, you can write uh, a Hamiltonian that incorporates both the electrostatic energy and the Josephson energy. Um, to be perfectly rigorous, you should include more than just the zero and one charge states for this region. There's actually higher energy bands. Uh, and also, I should point out, when you actually go to the quantum description of the circuit, the number and phase become operators uh, for the, the qubit. They, they're conjugate variables, and so they actually obey this uh, canonical commutation relation. I'm not going to focus on that. You can read more in, in the Tinkham's book on superconductivity for that. What I'd like to focus on uh, is the fact that in this region here, near the charge degeneracy, where the Josephson energy is, has lifted that and given you these two energy bands, you can reduce this Hamiltonian uh, to a simple Hamiltonian uh, for a two, oops, for a two-level system, okay? So the, the effectively, the Cooper pair box at that point near a charge degeneracy is just a, a two-level system. And you can describe it, again, where you have the electrostatic energy. Here, we're working in the charge basis, so we'll use a sigma z operator to represent the zero and one charge states. And just like any other kind of two-level system description, the, the Josephson energy, which represents mixing, is described by just a sigma x uh, matrix, okay? And so, again, at this, right at the avoided level crossing here, your eigenstates of the system are going to be uh, symmetric and anti-symmetric superpositions of charge. They're equally weighted right here, and then there'll be different weights as you move away from the charge uh, degeneracy point. Okay, uh, one other thing I want to point out. Again, I mentioned earlier that Josephson energy is, is tunable with magnetic flux that you can apply. Here, it's just chosen that uh, the flux gives you a Josephson energy of 18 gigahertz. You could tune that flux and thus tune the gap, say, down to 6 gigahertz. In principle, if the junctions are identical, you could tune that gap all the way down to zero. 
but in practice, there's usually a few percent asymmetry between the junctions, so you can only tune it down to a few hundred megahertz. Okay. All right, so that's it. So the Cooper pair box, the system with the junctions here and the electrode for biasing, we can describe it at one of these charge degeneracy points very well as a, as a two-level system that you can tune the energy gap for. And of course, you know, going back 15 years, 16 years now, people have done all kinds of really beautiful experiments with this, demonstrating Rabi oscillations, doing Ramsey interferometry experiments, integrating this kind of qubit in uh, uh, microwave cavities to do circuit QED. This just shows a picture of the vacuum Rabi splitting uh, that's demonstrated with uh, resonant coupling with a, um, a coplanar waveguide cavity. Okay, so the bottom line is this thing is well characterized and well understood to act like a two-level uh, quantum system. And you can read here, I've put a couple reviews uh, here that uh, provide a lot more details about how this works. Especially this, this review from 2001 and a review of modern physics uh, from Gerhard Schoen and Sasha Schneerman. They really get into a lot of the details of, of how to model the system and the assumptions you're making. Okay, so what I want to talk about next is how you actually couple this uh, to a mechanical device. So I have a little cartoon here which shows our qubit. We have the two Josephson junctions, one here and here. The island of the qubit is right here. Electrode that we can apply voltages to to turn the, tune the electrostatic energy. The magnetic field we can apply to tune the Josephson energy. I've included the Hamiltonian down here for the qubit. We pattern a nanomechanical device in close proximity to, to the island of the CPB. Typically, this distance here is on the order of about 100 nanometers. Okay, um, and it's important to point out that the nano resonator is usually is metallized, and usually we use uh, aluminum for that. And so the the way we actually can couple the motion of the mechanical system to the the qubit then is what we do is apply a large voltage between the two systems, uh, just a large DC voltage, typically on the order of volts. And then when this thing flexes in plane, because of the modulation of the capacitance here, that modulates the charge on the qubit island, which then modifies the electrostatic energy. Okay? So what you can do is you can expand this electrostatic energy for small displacement, and you get a really simple interaction term shown here, where these different uh, components is just the displacement, the A dagger plus A, the charge state of the qubit, sigma z, and then you have the prefactor here, which is the coupling strength. And that just depends upon mainly geometric parameters like the, dis the separation, uh, capacitance, the charging energy of the qubit, the compliance, basically, of the mechanical device. And then, uh, of course, there's the term component, uh, the factor here for uh, the DC voltage. Okay, so we can actually, an important thing to note is we can actually tune this coupling strength between the two systems in situ by just adjusting the, the voltage from a, a source that's connected to here. And I should have said this, the, and you can probably, t it's probably intuitive, the mode of this mechanical structure that couples most strongly to the qubit is generally the in-plane fundamental flexural mode. Okay. All right, so I think everybody, or most people, probably realize that this Hamiltonian is, is very similar to James Cummings' Hamiltonian in cavity QED. And so this is the formal analogy that I mentioned earlier between this qubit-coupled mechanical system and, and those uh, systems that have, um, you know, involving the coupling between an atom and microwave cavity or optical cavity. Uh, if you're not familiar with this, this uh, Hamiltonian, a really nice resource to check out is uh, Hiroshi's book, Exploring the Quantum. Also, I've given a reference here for a paper by Eleanor Irish and Keith Schwab, where they really go through uh, the derivation of this and uh, through the step, a lot of the steps that I've skipped in the process of, that I've talked about today. Okay, so question is, you know, how can we actually use this system, the qubit, as a tool to manipulate and measure uh, the mechanical device? And to answer that question initially, what I want to do is just focus on one limit that's um, relevant to the devices that I've, I've primarily developed or worked with in the past. And that limit uh, is a dispersive coupling limit. Okay, so in this limit, the coupling strength between the two systems is generally much, much less than the, the detuning, right? So the, the coupling strength is generally on the order of megahertz. The qubit's transition energy, I'll, on the other hand, is, is on the order of gigahertz. Mechanical frequency is typically on the order of tens to hundreds of megahertz. Okay, so the difference in energy between the CPB and the nano resonator is much, much greater than the coupling strength. 
So the two systems don't resonantly interact. But this interaction term still gives rise uh, to observable effects. Importantly, what this interaction term does is it shifts the energy of the two systems. And it shifts the energy in an important way. It shifts it so that the shift in energy of each system depends upon the state of the other system. Okay, So let me illustrate that. From the perspective of the nano resonator, its frequency becomes a function of the state of the qubit. So if the qubit's in the ground state, the frequency of the mechanical device will decrease. It's the minus sign. If the qubit's in the excited state, the frequency will increase. So schematically, if we look at like the energy spectrum of the device, we have the qubit ground state, qubit excited state, uh, ladder states for the harmonic oscillator for both cases. This is with the interaction turned off. If we turn the interaction on, what you see is that the qubits in the ground state, the harmonic oscillator levels are compressed. Qubits in the excited state, they get pulled apart. Okay, I've exaggerated the effect here, but the idea, the concept is correct. Okay, from the perspective of the, the qubit, on the other hand, its transition energy picks up a term that's proportional to the number of quanta in the mechanical device. Okay, and so I can, I'm going to just redraw this. And so what that means is transition energy for the qubit depends upon what state the nano resonator is in. If n equals 0, the transition energy is delta E plus h bar chi. If n equals 1, it's delta E plus 3h bar chi, and so on. Okay. So this is analogous to an AC Stark effect, AC Stark shift in, in atomic physics. So this should give you some idea of how we could use uh, the, the CPB or any kind of two-level system as a tool to probe and manipulate the mechanical device. You could imagine preparing the qubit in a superposition of states and turning on this dispersive coupling, and then the, the mechanical device would evolve into a superposition of states oscillating at two different frequencies. It's been done in cavity QED. These dispersive cat states have been created with such a technique. In principle, you could do the same kind of thing here. Another possibility would be to use the qubit to measure the number state spec the number state statistics of a mechanical device. You could imagine measuring the transition energy of the qubit, measuring its absorption spectrum, and inferring from the weighted uh, probabilities of these different transitions that you see what the number state statistics of the mechanical device are. Okay, so so far this effect has not yet. Uh, been demonstrated. People have shown a, a, a stark shift of a, a superconducting qubit in the large n limit, where it just these kind of individual light shifts, uh, as they're known in, in cavity QED, these individual discrete transitions are just blurred out. People have seen a broad kind of shift in the transition energy as you drive a mechanical device harder and harder. I'll show you that, that example later on, but the individual transitions haven't been seen. Um, I should say, I, I forgot to say one, one thing. Another reason that we're actually interested in developing this uh, dispersive interaction, another possibility, is you can actually show that the interaction is, is um, it, you know, you can write an effective Hamiltonian for it where you have sigma z times a dagger a. And it turns out, it's, you can probably appreciate, this interaction term actually commutes with the Hamiltonian for the, the nano resonator. So what this means is that you could use this dispersive interaction as a quantum non-demolition probe of the nano resonator's energy. Okay. Okay. So this effect hasn't been demonstrated yet. We have shown this effect here: the dispersive shift of the nano resonator depending upon the qubit state. Actually, my colleagues and I uh, went after through this experiment when I was a postdoc. So I just want to show you uh, some of the the work from that. So. The device that we actually developed is shown here. This is a nano resonator. Uh, it was made out of aluminum and silicon nitride. We were interested in the, the fundamental in-plane mode of this device. It had a resonant frequency of about uh, 60 megahertz. The qubit was shown here. It was separated. The gap here was about 300 nanometers. Um, you can see the junctions, one junction there, another one there. There's a flux loop here, so we can apply magnetic field to tune the Josephson energy. There's also an electrode here, so we can apply a voltage to tune the electrostatic energy of the qubit. And then there's another gate over here, 
uh, that we use for actuation and transduction of the nanoresonator's motion. So what we wanted to do was measure the frequency of, of oscillation of the fundamental in-plane mode of this structure as a function of the, the CPP's state. And in order to do that, we had to drive the mechanical device and then measure over time to, to track its frequency. Okay? And so the way we did that was we took this sample and we embedded it in another resonant LC circuit, which I've shown schematically here. And I'm not going to get into the details of how this works, but what we did was arrange things so that the impedance of this resonant LC circuit was a sensitive function of the frequency at which the mechanical device oscillated. Okay? So if the frequency of this mechanical device changed due to coupling, say, to the, the qubit, then the impedance of this circuit would change, and then we'd read that out using RF uh, reflectometry technique. Okay? So here, this shows uh, in the, the upper panel up here, this shows the frequency response of this device uh, in amplitude and phase. This is for no coupling, essentially, to the qubit. It's done at about 100 millikelvin for this measurement. Again, the frequency is about 60, uh, 58 megahertz. At this temperature, the qubit should be in its ground state. So if we turn on the coupling to the qubit, what we should see is this frequency response curve shift downward. Okay? So we turn on the coupling, and that's what we see. So this blue curve here is uh, the response of the mechanical resonator with the coupling to the qubit turned on. It shifted down in frequency, as we expect, for the qubit in its ground state. Also, the magnitude of the frequency here is about 600 hertz shift. It's consistent with what you expect if you plug in numbers for lambda and delta E for the, the geometry that we had. Okay, so this was the thing that to notice is that this shift of 600 hertz, it's about a part in a thousand of the, the bare frequency of the mechanical device, right? This is like 60 megahertz, it's 600 hertz. So, you could be asking yourselves, well, how do you know that by turning on the coupling between these two systems, you didn't shift the frequency of the mechanical device independently of the qubit? And so what we did to check that was we varied the gate voltage to change the electrostatic energy. That changes delta E. And we watched the frequency shift. We also changed the magnetic field to change the Josephson energy. Uh, that changes delta E. And then what we can also do, or we also did, was apply microwaves or RF uh, signals to the qubit to excite it to its um, excited state. And then this frequency shift here should change sign. Okay? So this plot here basically summarizes that. What's shown here in color is the frequency shift of the mechanics. Darker blue is a more negative frequency shift. The darker red is, is more positive. And the x and y axis here, this, the x axis is the gate voltage, is the static voltage that we could tune on the electrode near the qubit. And the y-axis is uh, the amplitude of the RF signal that we were applying to excite it. And so by tuning these, these knobs, what we could essentially do is tune the phase of the state vector of the qubit through a process called Landau's inner interference. And so just to give you an idea of how that works, here we have the qubit ground state energy band, excited state energy band. We would pick some DC bias that we would apply to, to the qubit. And then on top of that, we would apply this RF signal. And that RF signal would sweep the qubit through the avoided level crossing here where the charge degeneracy is. And so as the qubit's being swept through this avoided level crossing, it has a probability to tunnel to the excited state or stay in the, the ground state. And then on the return swing of the RF signal, it again, if it's in the ground state, it can tunnel to the excited, and vice versa. If it's up here, it can tunnel down there. So this is actually like a Mach Zander inter interferometer, but in, in charge space. Okay? And at the end of one cycle, you have a probability for the qubit to be in the excited state that's given by something like this. And there's a similar probability for the qubit to be in the ground state. Okay? And these probabilities here, this phase that develops in the evolution of the qubit along these, these trajectories here, it depends upon things like the, the DC gate voltage, the RF amplitude, the RF frequency, and so on. Okay? So you can map out an interference pattern with this versus the, these, different pat these different parameters. And that's what's shown in, in this plot here. Okay? So regions where you see darker red is where the qubit's excited state probability our, our maximum in regions where you see the, the darker blue, it's when the uh, ground state probability is maximum. And the important thing to point out here is the intersections of the, these contours is where you expect from a, uh, a model of that Landau-Zener uh, interference, 
where you would expect the excited state probability to, to be largest, and it agrees fairly well with what we, what we saw. Okay, so this, this gave us uh, confidence that we were using this nanomechanical device to read out quantum interference in a superconducting qubit. Moreover, it gave us confirmation that this simple, you know, James Cummings-like model that we were using for this system at least captured the physics of what was going on here with this qubit-coupled mechanical device, or at least in this dispersive sort of large end limit, okay? And I should say there was nothing quantum mechanical going on with the mechanics in this experiment. We drove it to very high amplitude, and actually you could explain this dispersive shift treating the mechanics classically. But still, we could apply this model to describe what was going on. It looked like a, a reasonable approximation for it. Okay, so further confidence in applying this model to superconducting qubits came out the following year. Our results were published in 2009. Then 2010, uh, Andrew Cleland's group at, at Santa Barbara uh, put forth this result that I, I mentioned in, in the second lecture yesterday. And so in the, what I said yesterday was that they developed this micromechanical device, uh, which you know it had a dilatational mode uh, with a frequency of about six gigahertz, okay? So it's a breathing mode of the structure that expands and contracts at six gigahertz. I mentioned yesterday that they demonstrated they could cool this down to the ground state. What I didn't talk about in detail, though, was that they inter integrated this system with a another kind of superconducting qubit, uh, a phase qubit that I, I mentioned before. And one of the things that's important uh, about this work that was different from ours is that because the mechanical frequency was so high, six gigahertz, that was comparable to the qubit transition energy. And so what they could actually do is tune the qubit into resonance with the mechanical mode. And actually, in that case, the, their system was described exactly by the James Cummings Hamiltonian, where the interaction now is given by this term with the creation and annihilation operators for the qubit and the mechanics, and it describes this resonant swapping of energy between the two systems. Okay. So let me, before I show some of the data from them, let me describe where uh, this, this comes from and how the, their system works. So uh, this is from their, their paper in 2010. It's an, a bird's eye view of their device. You have the mechanical structure down here at the bottom. It's coupled through some circuitry up uh, to the qubit, which is shown here. It's kind of hard to see from this, this uh, view, but the qubit, in a nutshell, basically consists of a single Joseph's injunction in parallel with a, a capacitor. Excuse me. This is a little simplified from what they actually have, but it captures the essence of how, how this qubit works. Okay. So they have their qubit is just a single junction in parallel with this capacitance here. And to understand how that you could use this as, as a, a you know a two-level system, the first thing to realize is that the the inductor, the Joseph or sorry, the Joseph's injunction looks like a nonlinear inductor. Okay. And to see that, what we can do is just write out the definition of inductance and write out here our Josephson relations. Okay? So the definition of inductance from Faraday's law is the voltage over the time rate of change of the current. If you plug these expressions in to here, you see that the current voltage relationship gives you this in inductance here that depends upon uh, the phase of the Josephson junction. Okay? We can make this uh, more intuitive by rewriting the, the cosine of the phase in terms of the current that's actually being applied to the junction. And you can see, indeed, that the current voltage relationship here for this junction in parallel with the capacitance actually depends upon the current that's going through the, the inductor. Okay, So a, a linear inductor doesn't depend upon the current passing through it. This, but this one does. It's, it's a, a nonlinear inductor. Okay, so. The next thing to realize is how you could use this as a, a qubit is to recognize that what you essentially have here is a nonlinear inductor in parallel with a, a capacitor. All right, so this gives you an anharmonic oscillator, right? So if it was just a linear inductor in parallel with the capacitor here, you would have a, a harmonic oscillator. But the fact that this frequency of oscillation of the LC circuit here depends upon the current. Uh, passing through the inductor that distorts that that potential, that harmonic potential that you'd n normally have. Okay. Okay. So the actual uh, potential energy of the of the um, of this little circuit here looks uh, more like this when, once you actually take into account um, the, the capacitor properly. 
it looks like this tilted washboard potential uh, in phase space. Okay? And actually, it's, it's straightforward to arrive at why the potential energy for this little circuit looks like this. And you can, you can arrive at it just uh, by considering Kirchhoff's laws for this circuit along with the, the Josephson relations. Okay? So you imagine that you're applying some current bias IB to the circuit. I amount of current goes this way. You have some current dV dt times C going this way. If you write out you know, current, Kirchhoff's current laws and then plug in the Josephson relations, you, you arrive at this expression, uh, which is an equation of motion, basically, for the phase across the Josephson junction. Okay? And if you think about it, this looks like, or is equivalent to a particle with some mass just given by uh, the flux quantum squared times c over 2 pi in a potential given by this washboard form. Okay? So just from Kirchhoff's laws and Josephson effects, you can ar arrive at this description of the Josephson junction that it's equivalent uh, to a particle in a potential uh, that looks like this. Okay? All right. So if you quantize these equations of motion, you get these energy levels in the, the, the locally in the wells. And because of the anharmonicity of the, the potential, you can actually use the 0 and 1 as, as a qubit. Okay? And the important thing to note is that you can tune these delta E's and delta U's, the delta E's, the splitting in the energy levels. And you can tune the, the delta U, the depth of this well, by just applying current pulses uh, to the system. And actually, the way they measure the qubit, whether it's in the ground state or the excited state, is they apply a current pulse that decreases delta U enough so that if the excited state is occupied, then this particle tunnels out and re you register a voltage pulse. Okay? So they have their qubit is essentially just a Josephson junction with a capacitor that looks like that gives you this anharmonic potential in phase. And you can I'm going to replace all this stuff here, which is this, that summary there. Okay, so you can fully tune this thing with just current pulses applied to it. Okay, so that's the the Josephson phase qubit. The mechanical element I've said a little bit about this before. Uh, what I haven't said, though, is that it's made, made out of piezoelectric material, so uh, specifically aluminum nitride. And it has these al aluminum electrodes sandwiched on the bottom and top of it. And so what happens when this thing flexes, or sorry, when it breathes, when it expands and contracts, because it's pie piezoelectric, it actually is polarizing these electrodes here. So you're getting charge polarized on these, on these plates. And as you can see in this diagram, in this picture, those uh, top plates and bottom plates are actually connected to a circuit that then runs to the qubit. Okay, so as this thing's oscillating, it's causing charge to oscillate back and forth on this electrode. That's drawing charge and causing charge to oscillate back and forth in the circuit here. And so the way they actually wire things is that the circuit is connected directly in with the Josephson junction. So the oscillatory motion of this device is drawing charge back and forth through here. So you have this alternating current passing back and forth through the, the Josephson junction. Okay? So this oscillatory dilatational motion modulates the current in the Josephson junction. And I'm not going to show this, but you can go from this, you can then go on to derive uh, this Hamiltonian that describes uh, the interaction here between between the junction and the mechanical motion, okay, and show that in fact you you get this this form, okay. But I just wanted to give you a sense of physically how do they actually couple the two systems together. If you want to look at the details of how you get to this from what I've just been talking about, you can look at the references within uh, the na the paper up there. Okay, so they have this interaction which describes a resonant swapping of energy between the two systems. The first thing they wanted to do was to verify that, in fact, this is what happens. And so what they do to do that is they apply a, a current pulse to the qubit. It's a pi pulse, so it puts it in the qubit in its excited state. They then tune the energy of the qubit to bring it into resonance with the nanoresonator. And then they leave the two interacting for some uh, tunable amount of time. Okay? And then after that time, they detune the, the qubit and they make a measurement of its state, see whether it's in the excited state. And so what they do, they do this many times, you know, thousands of times for each value of tau, and then they plot it out here. So this is the excited state probability of, of the phase qubit plotted versus this interaction time. For short times, uh, the phase qubit's in the excited state, that 
that excitation, the quantum that they put in it, hasn't had time to swap to the mechanical device. But if they let the delay time run longer, eventually the qubit probability goes to zero. At that time, for that amount of interaction time, that quantum has fully been swapped uh, to, the, to the mechanics. And then as they go a little bit longer, it's swapped back to the, the qubit. OK, so this was you know, the first demonstration uh, of energy quantization in a mechanical structural mode. Okay. One thing you can note here, though, or it's probably obvious, is that this, the decay time of these Rabi oscillations uh, was on the order of, of 10 nanoseconds, which is, which is pretty short. So the next thing to do would be to probe the, the relaxation time and, and the, the dephasing time of the qubit. Okay. Or actually, they probe T1 and T2. But we'll show these here. So the first experiment, the relaxation measurement, they apply a, a pi pulse to the qubit, put it in its excited state, bring it into resonance with the mechanics, allow it to interact with the mechanical device for half a Rabi period. So they swap that quantum into the uh, mechanics. They tune the qubit and then just let the system sit for some And then they bring the qubit back into resonance, wait another half a Rabi period to swap the quantum back into the, the qubit. They detune and measure the, the phase qubit. Okay? And so by doing that, they can trace out this exponential decay of the quantum as it's stored in the, in the mechanical device. All right, so what's happening during this time period here, the mechanical device has been excited to n equals one level, and for a long enough time, that excitation gets uh, lost in the environment, okay? And so what they find is, uh, for, you know, from a fit to this, T1 of about six, six nanoseconds. This is important. It was the first relaxation time that's ever been measured for a mechanical structural mode. And what was important also that it was consistent with the measured quality factor of the mechanical device. They measured through independent means a quality factor of about 260, which was within 10% of, which would give you a T1 uh, within 10% of that value that they measured there. Okay, I'll just show one more measurement that they did. Um, so they did a Ramsey measurement to, to look at uh, the decoherence time. This was similar to how they implemented the T1 measurement but instead of doing a pi pulse in the beginning, they did a pi over two pulse. So they prepare the qubit in a superposition of, of ground state and excited state, then bring it into resonance with the mechanics and wait half a Rabi period. So transferring that superposition to the mechanical state, then they detune the qubit, let the mechanics evolve on this block sphere with the zero and one energy levels, and then they bring the qubit back in to resonance, wait another Rabi period, half a Rabi period to swap that state back and do another pi over two pulse. And in doing that, then, they can look at the evolution of the mechanical device during this, this time period here and see the, these Ramsey fringes that you would expect. Uh, and they, from this, they can extract a T2 of about 20 nanoseconds. And actually, this was anomalously long compared to T1. Usually, you'd expect T2 to be about maximum twice T1, but they attribute that to um, sort of uh, imprecision in the calibration of the, of the pulses. But, yeah, and it was the first, this is actually provides these fringes here representing the sort of coherent evolution of this nanoresonator superposition state during this delay time represents the first demonstration of the superposition of, of mechanical structure. Okay, so this was a real tour de force experiment taking uh, at the time state of the art superconducting qubit technology and techniques and, and using it to probe some kind of quantum mechanical effect in a structure that, that's normally well described by, by classical physics. So it was a milestone for, for the field. So the question is, you know, after that, what, what, do, you do, what do you do next? And so the th one thing to realize is that both CPBs, charge qubits, and phase qubits have relatively short dephasing times. They're usually uh, much less than a microsecond. And for you know, charge qubits, these short dephasing times, um, they arise from the sensitivity of the qubit to, to charge fluctuations. In particular, the, the sensitivity to 1 over F charge fluctuations. So these um, qubits are solid state qubits. There's all kinds of uh, defects and, and imperfections and basically junk that's on, on these, these devices, uh, particularly at the interfaces between the junctions and the substrate and within the junctions itself, which is some amorphous oxide layer. And so these, uh, you know, these defects and such give rise uh, to flux you know, fluctuating charge uh, systems that then cause slow change in the energy of the qubit, which causes it to dephase over time. Okay, qubit, 
Uh, it's a similar kind of story. It's short dephasing times arise from 1 over f flux noise, although the origin of it is not entirely determined. But so why is this bad? Why is this a problem for us in mechanics? Um, well, I mean, thinking of some of the numbers I, I put forth earlier, the coupling strengths are, you know, for typical coupling strengths between these mechanical devices and, and the qubits are on the order of megahertz to tens of megahertz. So if you have dephasing times that are, you know, or def dephasing rates that are much, much greater than a megahertz, what this would generally mean then is that decoherence rates of any states that you uh, prepare would be likely to exceed the, the coupling strengths between the two systems. So the qubit would be more strongly coupled to the environment than, than the nano resonator. So I mean, just to give you an example, a device, uh, one of the measurements I did, um, this shows the transition energy of, of the Cooper, of a Cooper pair box qubit, which we measured, you know, a line width of about 170 megahertz. And I'm just going to move up here. That, that line width there, which is determined by both uh, T and, and T2, um, was much greater than the coupling strength that we de demonstrated. We had a bare coupling strength of something like 3 megahertz. So this is, you know, a couple orders of magnitude greater than that. And in fact, this was, you know, like five orders of magnitude greater than the dispersive shift that we measured, okay? So this basically, in our experiments, doing kind of advanced measurements, like trying to measure these discrete transitions, uh, these discrete stark shifts due to the nanoresonator uh, energy levels. I mean, the chi here was much, much smaller than, than the width of, the, of these state, these transitions. Okay, so importantly though, um, the field of uh, superconducting uh, qubits is about eight years ago demonstrated a, the development of a new system uh, known as the transmon. And sort of the defining characteristic of the transmon is that um, it's like a CPB. It's, it's basically a, a Cooper pair box, but it has a large shunt capacitor on it. And this shunt capacitor is much larger than the Josephson junction uh, capacitance. And so this just shows a, a, a figure from one of the original uh, transmons that was developed by, by Rob Sholkoff's group. Uh, you can see in this figure here, this interdigitated capacitor is the shunt capacitor at a total capacitance of about 50 femtofarads. Uh, whereas this zoom in here, which shows the junctions, the junctions had a capacitance of about one femtofarad. Okay, so these interdigitated capacitors here are serving to shunt, uh, or they're serving to shunt the, the, the junctions. And the reason this is important is that this additional capacitance that you're putting in there, it reduces the charging energy. So it reduces the sensitivity of the energy of the, your Cooper pair box to changes in charge, okay? And so you can see that actually in this plot. So this shows um, the first three energy bands of the CPB, the ground state, first excited state, second excited state, versus gate voltage, so that you're tuning on some nearby electrode. Uh, for different values of EC. And so as you go from top left to right and top to bottom, EC is getting smaller. And so what you can see is that the curvature in these energy bands decreases as you go to smaller and smaller charging energy or larger and larger shunt capacitance, okay? And so what this tells you as you go to larger and larger shunt capacitance, smaller EC, is that the difference in energy between the energy bands becomes less and less sensitive to, the, to charge. In the, in the surrounding uh, vicinity of, of the qubit, okay? So this limit up here where, it, you know, you essentially have the, uh, no dependence, at least b observably by I, on uh, charge that you're applying is known as, as the transmon limit. And so what this means then is that, you know, changes in charge will very weakly change the energy level spacing, and so that will limit the amount of dephasing or re reduce dramatically the amount of dephasing you would have of your system due to charge fluctuations, okay? Action, uh, taken and, and used with great success. This is um, a figure from the IBM group's uh, work, and their, their transmon is shown down here. The yellow like cross here is the junction. It's shunt capacitors are these large pads here. They actually made these, uh, their shunt capacitor this way out of large pads uh, so that would have two purposes. One, serve as a large capacitance, and two, also to serve as an antenna to couple to uh, the mode of a 3D microwave cavity. So they put this transmon instead of in like a 1D microwave cavity or 
they put it into an actual 3D uh, style cavity, which coupled strongly to this, this antenna here, and thus you know, coupled strongly to the transmon. But this configuration that they use, they've been able to demonstrate that they can have uh, you know, T2s approaching 100 microseconds. So this is you know, many orders of magnitude better than what had been achieved using uh, the Cooper pair boxes originally. And again, it's because they've introduced this extra capacitance here, which has gotten rid of the, the qubit's sensitivity to charge. Okay. So um, the, in the field of mechanics, we've started to take advantage of, the, of these developments. Uh, the first group to publish, or actually the only group to publish work so far with a uh, transmon qubit coupled to a nanomechanical device uh, was uh, Mika Salampa's group in Finland this is from a couple of years ago. And their transmon shown here. You can see the loop for the qubit. The Josephson junctions are in there somewhere. And you have uh, their shunt capacitor, which is interdigitated capacitor. They have a mechanical device that's coupled to the transmon. And you couple it in the same way that you couple it to the CPB. You just overlap it to give it some large capacitive coupling, and then apply a DC voltage to it. Okay, And then its motion will modulate uh, the energy of the qubit. Um, the mechanical mode that they actually used is a membrane type device, uh, and it had an out of plane resonant, fundamental resonant frequency of about 70 megahertz. And so, in this work, what they demonstrated was that they could, I alluded, to, I talked about this before, they demonstrated that they could shift the transition energy of the qubit, they could do this, an AC, give it an AC Stark shift uh, that was dependent basically, basically on the drive, the amplitude of the mechanical device. All right. And they I said before, they drove this to very large amplitude, to thousands of, of quanta in the mechanical system. So it was essentially in this classical limit for the mechanics. Uh, but this just shows one of the central results of their paper. This is the transition energy of the transmon uh, versus frequency. And these curves are for different um, values of frequency for the drive that was used to excite the mechanical device. So the mechanical device frequency was exactly you know, 71.842 megahertz. And what's going on here is these, the drive that they're using to excite the mechanics. Here, it's below resonance, so it's only weakly exciting the amp motion. And as you get closer to the resonance, you can see the curve of the transmon transition energy shift downward in frequency. And then as you go through the mechanical resonance, it shifts back. Okay. So this is an important result because they demonstrated sort of the complementary effect of what we saw um, in 2009 looking at the state-dependent shift in the mechanical resonator. And they demonstrated it in, again, this high-end limit where the mechanics was essentially classical. And the, you know, the reason, actually, that in this experiment, why they couldn't go in and look at these individual stark shift transitions for the different number states uh, was also related to uh, qubit quality. So they had a different issue than just um, dephasing due to charge noise. They were actually plagued by uh, dissipative quasi-particle tunneling. So I said in the beginning of the talk, one of the, the energy um, uh, characteristic energies you need for operation of the circuit was the gap energy between the Cooper pair ground state and the quasi-particle band. Uh, what can happen is if your leads aren't well filtered, like the lead coming in to provide the voltage bias for coupling the mechanics in the qubit, if that's not well filtered, you can have microwaves come in and break up the Cooper pair Cooper pairs and create these, these dissipative quasi-particles, and that can completely defeat your uh, qubit. And so that's what was probably happening with their, their device here. Okay? So what we've been doing in my group, we anticipated this kind of problem. Uh, and so what we've been trying to do is integrate um, a transmon-coupled nanoresonator into heavily filtered uh, co coplanar waveguide circuits shown here. And so just to work through some of this, this little meandering path here is a one-dimensional microwave cavity. There's a couple breaks in it. There's a capacitor here and a capacitor here, which define basically the ends of the cavity. So you can have standing microwaves in between those ends. And you know, you can, the mode that we're interested in actually has an antinode and voltage down near this region here. So what you can do is extend a, a stub off of that uh, coplanar waveguide trace uh, that then leads, you can see in the inset here, to this electrode that then couples to our transmon and also couples to our nano resonator. Okay, so what we're, again, we're doing is we're coupling a standing microwave mode inside this 1D uh, cavity with uh, the transmon and, and, and nano resonator here, 
And the purpose of this, there's a couple of purposes of having this, this microwave cavity here. We're using it for readout of the transmon, readout and manipulation of it. And also, we're using it to help filter uh, the electromagnetic environment, filter it uh, for the transmon, and also the nanoresonator. And so what we can do to provide the coupling between this nanoresonator and transmon here, we apply a DC voltage uh, through an integrated filter that's on the wafer. It's basically an LC filter that we've patterned, my group has patterned, that then connects to the coplanar waveguide, which provides further filtering. And so we can just put this DC signal in here uh, to provide the coupling between the mechanical motion and the transmon there. Okay, so we've actually, my group is, we've been working on this for several years, and this is the, des the most recent design that we have, uh, and we've just earlier in the year started testing it to make sure that we can get good quality transmons in this circuit. Uh, and so I'll show you some of the time domain data that we have. Um, so this plot just shows the measurement of the relaxation of the qubit excited state. It's been plotted so that it's actually the probability for the qubit ground state. So you see an exponential rise instead of uh, decay. But from these measurements, we can infer a, a relaxation time of about 15 microseconds. And this, we haven't, we, in this, the, these measurements, there's just a small coupling applied to the mechanical resonator. So we shouldn't see any kind of uh, effects from the, the mechanical motion in these measurements. We also do um, a Ramsey interference measurement of the qubit. We can find that we get T2 stars on the order of about a microsecond, which isn't uh, approaching what the IBM group has done, and it's two orders of magnitude from that, but it's also uh, over an order of magnitude better than what uh, has been demonstrated with a mechanical device integrated with the system. And so what we should, with this kind of uh, coherence time and this kind of relaxation time for our device, and given the, the coupling strengths that we calculate, um, we think we should be able to uh, see the interaction with the mechanics and uh, possibly be able to see this number state splitting that I've talked about before. Um, the, those measurements are going on. We've turned on the coupling between the mechanics and, and the qubit. And I had struggled with whether or not I'd talk about the data that we have so far. And <laughs> it's, it's actually at the point where we see some Thing that's interesting, it looks like it's due to the mechanical resonator, but it's actually more complicated than we imagined. And so we're working now uh, with my collaborator, Fred Brito, to try and understand this system and do a full model of the coplanar waveguide plus the nanomechanical device plus the qubit and start trying to understand what we see in the data and if it makes sense and is consistent with the, the mechanical device being there. So uh, the best I can say right now uh, with this experiment is to, to stay tuned. Um, but I, you know, I also was thinking about, so this work that we have been just talking about here is sort of the culmination of several years of, of development of engineering of these, the superconducting circuits. And I was thinking about talking about that uh, today also, but it's mainly just engineering and I, I didn't want to get bogged down in those kind of details. But if you're interested in it, uh, we do have a paper on the archive that discusses its developments over the past few years. And of course, I'd also be happy to talk about it if you want to learn more. Okay, so let me just wrap things up um, with some thoughts about where things could go with these systems. So one of the things that I thought would be cool uh, with these uh, superconducting qubits would be to integrate arrays of nanomechanical devices with them. And this is something that nobody's done yet. And actually, I don't think any real theoretical work has been put into this. But what you can do is you can show that you know if you're in the dispersive limit where these mechanical devices are detuned far in energy from the qubit, uh, you know, and just expand its transition energy, the qubit's transition energy for the displacement of all these different devices, you find that you get this sum, this collection of terms here, which are just represent bilinear couplings between each of the mechanical resonators in the array. And so this gives you a way potentially. Uh, to engineer, um, you know, bilinear coupling between uh, many different resonators, which is tunable. So you could actually go in and tune these interactions individually by just adjusting the, the voltages between the reson each individual resonator and the qubit. And that would be tuning these individual lambdas here. Okay, so maybe this would give you a way to engineer entanglement between distantly located uh, uh, nano resonators in this array. It also, possibly, it could be used for simulating the interaction between arrays of, of nano resonators. Maybe looking at how um, they thermalize if you introduce an excitation into one of those systems. 
I, I just, I don't, I haven't worked it out any more than this and except to look to make sure that these coupling strengths look good and they're about the order of what, you know, we've gotten before in terms of, of, of coupling strengths. So, um, you know, this is one possible direction that one could go in the future with these systems. And actually in terms of engineering this, uh, it would be straightforward to engineer up to about 10 mechanical devices coupled to, to one transmon or, or coupe repair box. With the transmon, in principle, you could add uh, many dozens of, of nano resonators, but it gets tricky then having individual voltages going down to providing the coupling. You might have to, just because of cabling, have to share uh, voltage biases. But anyways, this, something like this is definitely feasible. Yes? Yeah. So yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't say what these terms were. I should have said that. So Xi and Xj are the displacements of each of the nano resonators. So you, uh, so you're saying, how do you? Yeah. Okay. So if you want a resonator one and resonator n, what you could do is you would turn off three n minus one, four and two, and turn on one and n, and then you could tune each one of those to whatever value you wanted to, and then that you would only have this term plus their individual dispersive couplings to the, the qubit. Yep, you could turn all these on and then have each one of them coupled to each other. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. Because, it, yeah, if, if it's in the individual voltage is turned off and that lambda is zero, and then so that, you know, whatever, ch those terms related to that one are not in there. Yeah. Yeah, at, at this order of the expansion, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's dispersive, yeah. Um, right. Okay, and sort of, you know, just a final thought on what the ultimate limit, I think, of, of these systems are, would be um, to, you know, take advantage of a number of different develop technological developments, first of which would be to integrate graphene mechanical devices with these uh, superconducting systems. The graphene mechanical devices have been demonstrated to have high frequencies, uh, you know, in the tens of megahertz. And I would imagine that 100 megahertz would be possible. They've been demonstrated to have high quality factors of 10 to the 5. Um, and in principle, because of the, the compliance of these, these sheets of graphene, because the mass is so small, you could have engineered large coupling strengths um, to your uh, to any kind of superconducting qubit that you coupled it to. Um, in addition, we'd integrate this with you know filtered microwave cavities like we've demonstrated in my group. And I think a really interesting prospect would be uh, to go with uh, to start engineering um, integrating flux fluxonium qubits with these systems. And I haven't said anything about how fluxonium works. Um, but the thing that's really cool about these devices, which have been developed by Michelle Devere's group at Yale, is that they've demonstrated that you can actually tune these things down to have transition energies that are on the order of 500 or 600 megahertz and still have really high qubit qualities with T2s in the tens of microseconds. And so th why this would be important for mechanics is, you know, our mechanical frequencies, we can get them up as high as a gigahertz, but it's much easier for us to work with them down in the hundreds of megahertz range. So what this gives us would be an opportunity to actually have um, a qubit in resonance with this mechanical, a mechanical device that, that's in you know, the order of uh, hundreds of megahertz, okay? So we could really get out of this far detuned dispersive limit and get closer uh, or actually into the resonant limit with flexural devices, which would be something really new. And in principle, I think you could do that with, with graphene resonators. Okay, so these are some of just thoughts about I, what I, that I have about how you could really push this technology to, to its ultimate limit to really develop it as a test bed for probing uh, quantum properties of motion of, of structures like this. And so, you know, I think I'll, I'll end it here. And I just want to close by saying that you know I hope I've um, you know given you the idea that mechanics is becoming a new tech, new quantum technology. It's emerging as a new quantum technology. Uh, with many possible applications and also uh, relevance for different fundamental studies. And um, I think these qubit mechanical systems will serve as an important part of, of the development of, of these guys. So I want to thank you for your, your attention over the last uh, several days. I've had a really great time this week and uh, enjoyed the, the conversations I've had with, with, with you guys. And uh, thanks also to, to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here. And, I, you know, really, uh, it was mentioned, somebody else said this earlier today, but giving me the opportunity to really organize my thoughts about 
you know, putting together a review on the field. Um, that was really helpful. And of course, if you have any questions, you can, you know, uh, email me at this address here. So thank you. Hello. Uh, so um, we've seen uh, several, you know, applications of these the circuits and, and you know devices to to uh, you know investigate like the those more fundamental questions about like when like you know when when do these guys have like quantum um, behavior? But um, are there like more technological or, or applied uh, applications? Like, can you measure, you know, the velocity of an, uh, an airplane better with these guys, or, or make better radios or, or something like that? Sure. Uh, so mass sensors would be the first. I don't, I don't know if you saw the first lecture. So nanomechanical devices are being developed for for mass sensing, um, and a couple applications of that would be for you know detection of hazardous airborne materials, and I mean because they can really. Um, these, as mass sensors are very, um, their, their responsivity is very high. They have very low mass, so they can detect very small quantities of a particular chemical. I mean, they're very, they can are actually sensitive now to um, individual molecules landing on them. So you can imagine, and people are trying to do this, functionalizing those devices uh, to only bind to a certain kind of, you know, chemical that you're interested in detecting, and then developing that as a detector. Um, other possible applications, uh, <laughs> I mean, besides the, the imaging tech, uh, application that I also talked about in the first lecture, um, I'm drawing a blank <laughs> right now on that. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. It, definitely those two. There's, there's certainly more. Um, but uh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Yeah. The imaging application is very nice. Yeah, so you can absolutely. detect the presence of one molecule or something it, one, through its it, mass. Yeah, the idea was to develop, I mean, you in principle, these devices would have the sensitivity to detect the spin from an individual hydrogen nuclei. So you could do uh, MRI, except for, you know, with like 100 million times the sensitivity of conventional MRI, where you'd be, in, you know, sensitive to individual uh, nuclei. I mean, that, that was the dream of that kind of imaging. They haven't quite gotten there. They've gotten down to uh, ensembles of dozens of nuclei, um, and I think they're actually moving toward another technique to get to, or implementing another technique and to get to a single nuclei, but yeah. It's very interesting. So do we have more questions? <laughs> so my, here in Parachi, we have this long tradition of measuring Wigner functions of the, I don't know, any kind of resonator just by measuring the qubit, right? So Leandro and I, for instance, will have this proposal to measure the Wigner function of a, the field inside of um, a waveguide by measuring the superconducting qubit. Uh -huh. So was this kind of thought about for for mechanical resonators as well? I mean, I think it's kind of the same thing. But right, so you by coupling it to the qubit and then by performing state measure different Rotations just on the, on the cubit, cubit and measuring yeah, it. I, I haven't seen um, a proposal to actually do that yet. No, but I mean, I think the same techniques could could be adapted to it for sure. Um, if it would just be matter, it'd be a matter of doing like sigma x and sigma z kind of rotations well, and. Actually, we just measure sigma z. We just have to displace the cube and measure the sigma z all the time. Okay. Yeah. I see. Oh, so okay. So actually. Right, you'd be rotating the resonator around its sort of yeah, phase space, and then, phase yeah, phase that I mean, I definitely haven't seen any proposals to do that, but it, it could be done. You could you could actually tailor the pulses that you're applying to the mechanical device <coughs> to rotate it in that way, for sure. Yep. So, if you can uh, measure mass, uh, can you also measure gravitational fields, or so? Uh, uh, yeah, so that's interesting. So using this as like a NEMS, um, I mean, it'd be essentially an accelerometer 
in, in that sense, right? Or, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, you certainly could. Uh, I mean, people have developed, I think, MEMS devices for, for that application. Um, I'm not, I have, I've never done any estimates of what the sensitivity would be for, for the sensing of gravitational fields. I do know, that, I mean, there was work being done um, uh, at Stanford um, where they were actually trying to look, probe gravity at, at reduced dimensions. And so they had a micromechanical device which had like a gold layer on it and then underneath um, they had some spinning micro disc basically with alternating um, sections of different mass. So it would be like gold and then silicon or something. And so they have this AC gravitational signal between the spinning disc and the mechanical device. And so they, what they wanted to see really was probe whether or not you have this one over R squared force dependence uh, for gravity as you got to smaller and smaller dimensions and see if there's some deviation from it which would reflect some, th some predictions of string theory. Mm -hmm. People have done stuff like that. I would imagine if you can measure gravity that sensitively, then it, it would be possible to use it in other applications, but yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Uh, are the sources of of the noise that causes the dephasing and the uh, loss of energy the dissipation well understood? For the mechanics? Yeah. No, it's uh, completely open. Uh, the, the modeling of it and uh, you know getting control of what's <coughs> dominating uh, the, the different devices is an open field. Um, they're just, so things like in the first lecture I mentioned, or yesterday's lecture I mentioned just, you know, qualitatively a couple different sources like radiation damping where you have elastic waves radiating, at, radiating through the substrate at the clamps. <clears throat> um, that's understood, but that was only, the theory for that was only really worked out, uh, <clears throat> sorry, like five or six years ago, and it hasn't, even that measurement, not many measurements have been done to, to confirm that that model works. But in terms of other things like, I mean, we're sub, these mechanical devices have one over F uh, noise in their frequency, which we see, especially as we go to really low temperatures into the millikelvin range, it becomes prominent. And so you can start to see their frequencies jumping all over the place. And the origins of that is, is not well understood. And so presumably those sources would also then be a significant source of dephasing. And then also um, you know, could have relaxation contributions too. So yeah. Um, it, I should say, though, in the result, in the work of, of Cleland's group, where they did have this really short um, sort of T1 and T2 time, they weren't entirely surprised by that because they, they were using aluminum nitride, and aluminum nitride is a really lossy material. Um, and, I mean, they knew from the start that their mechanical Q was affected by that and very low of Q of 260 or whatever. Um, and so it was actually important that, I think in that case, you could attribute the relaxation uh, time that they made in their measurement um, completely to the losses that were determining the, the, the Q of the mechanics that they measured. Um, so maybe in that case it's understood, but yeah. Is it even conceivable that you could um, get a sensitive enough to have a meaningful bound on, on this possible you know, crazy non-quantum collapse due to gravity <laughs> kind of ideas? Is it sensible with the technology right now? No, but in, it could I, th I could imagine that the technology will continue to improve that you could start to put bound, bounds on that in, in the future. Yeah. I don't know how far in the future though. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? I should say that also I think with these micro-mechanical and nano-mechanical devices it, we wouldn't be able to put any kind of bounds on those sort of gravitational collapse scenarios. These are just too small a mass. But with the large scale like you know, gram size oscillators. I think people already are starting to estimate some bounds, and there, there's some papers. I think Marcus Aspelmeyer might have a paper on, on that. But these guys, um, so the w devices that we work with right now are about 10 to the minus 16 kilograms, 10 to the minus 17 kilograms, something like that, yeah. <laughs> You've shown us uh, the decay rate of the in excit excitation in the nano resonator yep. through the coupling with a qubit, right? Right. right. So can, can you please show the slide again? Yeah. I think this was the first slide you show about this. This one? So the decay this rate. one, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you vary the time uh, at which the excitation stays in the resonator, right? Right. And then at, at the end, you measure only the qubit. Right, yep. 
That's what they did. And then yep. you can infer the the decay rate and also the radio oscillations in the in the nano resonator. That's right. So the the idea is is that in the end, when you when they measured the the qubit state, um, if they found the qubit to be so what they did before that measurement is they brought the qubit back into resonance with the mechanics so that, and they did that for a half a Rabi period. So if the excitation was still present in the mechanical device, it would then get swapped uh, to the qubit. And um, then when they went to measure the qubit, they would see that it was in the excited state. But if they mm -hmm. measured it was in the ground state, then that means that excitation had been lost to the environment before that. I see. Yep. All right. More questions? So let us uh, thank once more Professor Lahey. Thank you. And let us also thank all the professors of this uh, school.